Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Sashwita Gupta, your ACC mentor. So I hope the students who were giving their SBR exam that went well. So today we are here with advanced audit and assurance grant revision. Even though I was supposed to do it in a live session, but I thought that there are some technical glitches uh, sometimes. So let's do it as a recorded format and it will also take me less amount of time and I will be able to make a short crisp content for you because I understand that only few days are pending in your exam and I don't want to take a lot of your time. So you can attend it uh, at the given time and wherever you want before the exam, one day before the exam now, Wherever you want that I now need a consolidated set of revision of all the ISAs and, you know, the major portions of the syllabus so that I understand what is going to be tested, how to write answers, how things works in audit. So just a confidence booster right before your exam. Disclaimer, this video cannot be used for the preparation of advanced audit as complete. Like if you have not done anything and if you think that you will just... Uh, watch this video then you'll be able to cover the thing because yes maybe you'll be able to cover many portions of your syllabus you'll be able to revise many portions of syllabus not cover because I'm going to touch up on the things I'm going to revise it like in a fast track way but I would highly suggest you that advanced audit and assurance needs a lot of question practice exam techniques which are not something which you can understand with one piece of video so let's get started, everyone, and keep your cup of coffees with you, full energy. And we are going to crack this paper together in this very attempt, in very first go. So let's get started with our Advanced Audit and Assurance March 2024 Grand Revision. So before I begin, I need to talk about the uh, format of the paper. So I hope everyone knows that we have three questions in our exam. Question number one is for 50 marks. Okay, so they ask you business risk, they ask you uh, audit risk or risk of material misstatement in this particular question where you are supposed to identify the risk and you are supposed to also, you know, not just identify but explain as well. So I'll discuss the strategy of explanation of the risks part just in a while. And in question number four, 40 marks are for technical marks and 10 marks are professional marks, right? So these 10 marks are something which can game which can be a game changer for you. The reason that if you are able to completely get these or majority of these marks, even if technically you were incorrect in some areas, you'll be able to get, you know, that passing score. And the major reason why people fail is that, okay, technically you got out of 80, let's suppose you got 40. And they're not able to get 10 marks out of those professional marks uh, to pass this paper. So the examiner can stop you from passing with, you know, twisting those professional marks. So you have to make sure that your professionalism in the answers is on point. So I was checking the scripts of many of my students and I realized that there were some issues with the professional marks. There were some issues in the way they were answering. So the way you answer is that you have to first of all address the requirements. So if the examiner has asked you that assess audit risk, then just the audit risk. If by chance you, uh, if if he asked you risk of material misstatement and by chance you've stated any detection risk in that question, that gives a very bad impression to the examiner. He asked you to prioritize the risk. How do you prioritize the audit risk? If it was a new client, you know, if there were some frauds, fraud is a priority. So you prioritize the risks based upon their intensity, their significance, their materiality by nature and by amount as well. So if something was there in the question which you think was highly prioritized, like issues with those charged with governance, like fraud. So these things are high priority topics and you need to prioritize these risks in your answer. And if you don't do it the right way, you might lose marks in professional marks, not if technically, but of course in professional marks. So this is something which needs a little bit of understanding. So without any further delay, let's get started with our today's class and let's see what we have in question number two. So question number one, I gave you an idea of question number two is related to uh, mostly it's related to your sometimes you will find uh, like quality management here, professional issues, ethical issues. That requirement is always there. It's omnipresent. If you pick up any past paper, they talk about quality management. They talk about uh, fine ethical and professional issues in this question. Then they even ask matters to be considered here. 
So the matters to be considered, like you will have to talk about the accounting treatment, you'll have to talk about the materiality, you'll have to talk about its impact on the financial statement that is here. And then you have question number three, sometimes, you know, other assignments majorly, and even sometimes you will find review and reporting here or review and reporting can be only present anywhere. So when I talk about other assignments, which other assignments are very important for this attempt? If you have gone through the super 20 questions, which were given by me, uh, I already gave you the questions just on fraud and the uh, prospective financial information. Because I really believe, as per my analysis, that these are the two most important uh, other assignments for this very attempt. But that doesn't mean that we can miss out on others. So I will just revise these two. I hope the other two you can revise on your own capacity. So this is what we have in our syllabus of audit. So let's get started with its revision and understand what all things are important in our exam. Theoretically, practically, technically, it's a very interesting paper. So you'll enjoy this whole video, even if you know, you're know you not from ACC background, this is a very enjoyable paper. So let's talk about ethics. So in ethics, we have some principles to be followed, which are Pi Corp. Yes, what is Pi Corp? Professional behavior, integrity, confidentiality, objectivity, and professional competence and due care. Professional behavior means that I am being, you know, uh, I'm competent. First of all, I must be competent. Yes, professional behavior means not just competence. Competence is still there in this one. But professional behavior means that I'm not bringing disrepute to my profession in any way. For example, if you don't take up calls with your clients or, you know, they, uh, for example, you falsely advertise or you lie about your qualification, all these things comes under bringing disrepute to the profession and thus not professionally good, like not having a professional, good professional behavior. So this is about behavior. Then you have integrity. Integrity is being straightforward, truthful and honest. So in your audit report also, you're supposed to be honest and that is when you follow integrity. Confidentiality, we all know that whatever we have gained as our business, you know, whatever we gain as our business relationship, any data or any information that we've gained via our business relationship, we should keep that confidentiality. We, that is coming under duty of confidentiality. But you can breach this duty of confidentiality under two Conditions. What are these two conditions? Public interest, okay, and what? By law. So you might be required by law to actually come up and, you know, in the court, you are supposed to give your witness or you're supposed to give an information which you acquired as a process of your business uh, relationships. That doesn't mean you will say, no, court, I will not come because I'm bounded by the duty of confidentiality. Law is always above anything. So law is even above these code of ethics, right? So law of the land is the major thing that we follow. So if law asks us to, you know, give us some information, we are supposed to give. Public interest, for example, if you think that someone is fraudulent, you know, they take services and then they don't pay, or you think that uh, they are not in like doing bad to the community. So you, what you can do is in public interest, you can breach that duty of confidentiality and speak up. So that this thing never happens with the other counterperson in the business, like in uh, general in community. For example, if you found something which was fishy, let's suppose you bought a cake or uh, you are working in a bakery and you are uh, got to know that they, they use expired products. So because you were working in that bakery, you got to know that they were using expired products. So by the duty of confidentiality, you might not disclose it without the prior permission. But it is in public interest, no? The people, the consumers are getting food poisoned because of that cake. So you are supposed to speak up. That is when you can breach your duty of confidentiality. Then what we have is professional competence. So that is application of knowledge, training and experience. Your knowledge on IFRSs, your knowledge on uh, reporting standards, auditing standards, Whatever work you're doing, you should be competent in that. So knowledge, training, and experience. This is what I mean by professional competence. So if you see any auditor doing the wrong work, if you see any accountant doing the wrong work, you need to point that out and question their professional competence. 
if they are being biased, maybe due to some threat like familiarity, they are being biased towards that client. Then you need to say that they are breaching their objectivity. But in most cases of audit, you will find that there are these threats which are available in the case study, which you are able to identify. First, you have management threat, which is a very, very uh, important and significant threat. And if it arises, there's no safeguard which, which can, you know, uh, bring the threat to an acceptably low level. So management threat means when you get into the shoes of the management, you get into the shoes of the management, that means you act like management. Now you believe that this is your duty to uh, actually do the internal control or manage the internal control, design, implementation, maintenance, DIM of internal control is your duty. You start believing that. You get into the shoes of the management. If you are preparing financial statements, you start believing that it's my duty to prepare it. You take the responsibility. And if you take up that responsibility, then you're the auditor. You are not supposed, as an examiner, examiner doesn't write your paper, right? You write your paper. You're responsible for your paper. He just checks it, assesses it. Imagine the examiner becomes responsible for writing your paper. That threat is like, imagine I'm your examiner. So I am responsible for uh, my, uh, you know, my students. If they uh, write something, I'm responsible for that because I taught them. So imagine that I become your examiner and you know it. So in that situation, what will happen? Management threat. I was responsible to teach you. I was responsible to get good answers out of you. And now I am responsible for your checking also. Management threat. Right. Then what do we have? Advocacy threat. What is this advocacy threat? This is a situation where you promote the interest of your audit client. As an auditor, you're supposed to be unbiased. You are very uh, truthful, crystal, crystal clear that you're not supposed to take sides of anyone. But for example, the audit client says, please accompany us to the bank and get us a loan. So there you're promoting the interest of the client, right? You might say something just so that he gets loan. You become his advocate. That is an advocacy threat. Then third, self-interest. So we all know what is self-interest. So if there is any, you know, gifts, hospitality, anything which is given to us as an auditor, unless it is trivial, that is by its nature, value and intent. So you can accept trivial uh, gifts. But if they are very material, for example, their nature is uh, very material, their value is very material or their intent is malified. So in that situation, you'd politely decline the gift. Why? Because it gives rise to self-interest. You, you know, you feel like, okay, I'm getting some benefits out of here. So you get into that self-interest and you become biased. So self-interest is something which is there. And then you have self-review. What is self-review? If I check you, uh, if I tell you that check your own assignments, check your own tests, so testing your own work, Checking your own work is self-review. Imagine the uh, financial statements are prepared by the auditor and the auditor is only checking it. That's not possible. No, how will he find his mistakes? So he will hesitate to find his mistakes. So that is known as self-review threat. Then you have intimidation. Yes. What is intimidation? Either you are actually pressurized or you assume pressure. So, for example, if someone really, you know, uh, puts an undue influence on you that I am your senior or if that intimidation threatens, for instance, your boss, uh, you were working with someone and now you've become the auditor and now your boss is your audit client. So, you'll assume some pressure that, you know, you have worked under that person and you are a little bit afraid of that person and now uh, you are actually doing the audit of that person. So, that is where you assume pressure and that is intimidation threat. And this intimidation threat is something which we need to communicate to TCWG. And as a result, we can even resign from the audit if actually the client is intimidating us. For example, if the client says that, you know, complete the audit in two months, intimidation, limiting the scope of audit. How can you tell me why, when I should be done with my work? You're not supposed to tell me. Second, the client says, if you do not reduce the fees, we will not reappoint you. He's pressurizing us. He's telling us to reduce the fees. He's telling us to low ball. He's telling us to reduce the quality of our work. As an auditor, it is not ethical for us to do so. And he's, you know, pressurizing us to do this. And that is where you will say that, okay, this is uh, too much. And now I resign from the audit. 
So this is basically where we talk about intimidation threat. And then lastly, we have familiarity threat. What is familiarity threat? When you have long association with the audit client, maybe close association, maybe you're friends with your client, or maybe you are, uh, you know, you know them since a very long time. So you become favorable to them. Again, you compromise your objectivity. So in case of management threat, what do you compromise? Your objectivity, your in, uh, this independence, advocacy, again, your objectivity is compromised, self-interest, your independence is compromised, self-review, your objectivity is compromised, intimidation, your independence is compromised, here also your objectivity is compromised. So as an auditor, you need to be independent. No, I'll make my own decisions. What I want to do, when I want to do, how I want to do. You just don't interfere. But if the client interferes or somehow you accept his interference, that is a threat to your independence, right? So self-interest threat is also a threat to independence. So that is what I mean by ethical threats. How to answer our questions or case studies in the exam which are related to ethics. So first of all, guys, you need to identify the threat. What threat is there in the case study? Just identify it. Then explain why is it a threat? Why do you think is it a threat? Don't write the basic definition of the threat. That won't give you any marks. Related with the case study, why do you think it is a threat? For example, if they say that you were invited into a party of a very in a luxury hotel by the client as an auditor, so you will say, why is it a threat? Because if we go into that party, first of all, we it might, you know, we might become greedy. Secondly, going into that party, we might become too close of friends with our client and that will further raise familiarity threat. So greedy reflects self-interest and becoming too close, like becoming having an association with them reflects familiarity threat. So this is how you explain why is it a threat. Then you get into the significance of the threat. What do you think? Okay, you've identified the threat. Now, what is the significance of the threat? Imagine an intern is given a gift. If interns are given gifts, you don't say that these are something which is very significant because you have to see the uh, person involved, the amount involved, the intent involved. So if the threat is associated to an engagement partner, it is of a high level risk. If the threat is associated with the manager, the risk reduces. If it is associated with the junior, the risk further reduces. So if you say that our uh, audit engagement partner has a familiarity threat with the audit client, we are not supposed to audit. We are supposed to rotate that partner, remove that partner or resign from the audit. But when we say an audit junior is having a familiarity threat, then it's very simple for us to say that remove the junior, bring someone else, uh, replace him, and that's it. So significance is something which matters the most. Then once you've done this, you have to also talk about the safeguards. So mostly the safeguards are like, you know, separate team should be there. If we are also providing some non-assurance services and we are also providing audit services, so we say, separate team like Chinese walls no uh, we'll have separate teams and they will not communicate amongst each other and then you have your uh, this quality control review done which can be your external quality control internal quality control hot review cold review dependent upon the type of the situation and the significance of the threat right so this is ethics let me just discuss few situations of ethics with you some common situations, gifts and hospitality, I told you, you discuss about the nature, the value and the intent. These are the three keywords. If it is trivial, you can accept it. If it is significant by its nature, value or intent, you are supposed to politely decline it because it gives rise to self-interest threat. Then if I talk about fees, if you are having or you are over-dependent, over-dependent, on the fees. So if the fees from a client is 15% or more, 15% or more for two consecutive years, that means you are highly dependent on that client. It's a material client for you. So in that situation, what you will do, if it is for the two consecutive year, this is the case, you are supposed to 
talk to tcwg convey this to those charged with governance of that company that this is happening reduce your dependence on the fees maybe you are providing multiple services stop providing one of the services reduce your dependence so that is what you do quality control review is also conducted in this case so this is dependence on fees then close business relationship i already talked about this imagine you having the audit firm having any joint venture with the audit client close business relationship so you can't be the auditor in that situation an audit junior has something still you can apply safeguard and say remove the junior from the team but if the engagement partner has some joint venture with the director of that company it is a very significant threat so we will not go ahead with this client if you have some financial interest let's suppose the engagement partner has some shares in the audit client that is strictly prohibited so you he needs to immediately disinvest he needs to immediately dispose of those financial interests from the uh, audit client so this is what is there in our close business relationship then contingent fee this is not allowed so you are supposed to tell the uh, you know contingent fee is when the client says we will base your fees on these these parameters or you know it we will make it variable if you achieve these goals if you give us um, unmodified audit opinion then we'll pay you this otherwise we'll pay you this so we tell used to we have to tell them that dude this is not something which we accept and just uh, get off with it and we are not going ahead with this this is our fees this is the basis of our fees it depends upon the work required scope of the work and you know when when we have we are supposed to communicate the timing so the level of the work required is what will decide the fees of the audit and not what the client sees so that is what we will uh, talk about and director of audit client so if you are or you have been a director of audit client and now you are you know see uh, you can't act as a director of audit client only if one mention is there with regards to company secretary because company secretary is someone it's a position where you guys just talk about the laws and regulations and its compliance so in that situation it's still acceptable otherwise if you were a director of the audit client or you are a director of audit client you can't become the auditor of course and it is a very serious threat because then you know almost everyone in that company you know the processes you know how it works and if you have been uh, you know you you have been the director and now you're the auditor so this is totally disallowed under the code of ethics so you can just read out those set of situations in ethics next very important very widely spread area in your case studies where the audit client is given some other services apart from audit services that is non assurance services so if i give such a non assurance services to my listed client which is material then it is not allowed i can't give material non assurance services to my audit client if the client is listed what is material if it is related to financial statement preparation if it is related to valuation if it is related to tax calculation if it is related to anything which impacts the financial statements that is material so you're not allowed at all three are totally prohibited services one is accounting another is bookkeeping and payroll these are to fully prohibited you are not supposed to provide these services at all to the listed clients because that raises a serious management threat and a serious self review threat because if you start doing preparation of financial statements then how are you the auditor you're getting into the shoes of the management totally disallowed immaterial few services are allowed like advisory you can advise your client but they should not depend upon your advice they should not you know uh you should not assume management responsibility or they should not be taking very high level advices from you that the whole money that they are making is because of your advice so in that such a situation should not be there so if you remember in one of our super 20 questions there was this case study where there was a small client and this small client was taking advisory services from us so we made this point that this is a small company and it is working because of our advice so here we are assuming management threat then tax filing see tax filing is an administrative thing to do you might feel that if you file taxes for your clients it's a big deal but honestly it's administration but if you calculate the taxes okay that is something which is material to the financial statements because that is the amount which is reported in the 
PNL and the balance sheet. So tax filing is allowed, advisory is allowed with safeguards, but other services mostly in case of listed companies, listed, not only listed, but also public interest. Public interest companies are not just listed companies. For example, if you are working in a chemical uh, sector, which, you know, if something bombards out of it, it will affect the, uh, maybe the city, the state, or maybe the country at a large. So that company becomes public interest entity. So all the public interest entities, this is the rule. And if I talk about unlisted companies, mostly all the services can be provided with the safeguards. Which safeguards? That I should have separate, I should have separate team and quality control review should be done. QCR should be done. That's it. So this is what we have for our ethics part. Now coming to our audit okay i move in the direction of the actual process of audit so i told you as a code of ethics this is what you follow now when you accept a client when you obtain a client what is the process what are the rules or the points which you need to remember just a quick revision of those points then once you've accepted the client uh, how do you sign the engagement letter? Once the engagement letter is signed, then how do you start the audit? What are the risks that you find in the audit uh, planning, understanding phase? And then how do you collect the evidence or how do you perform the procedures to collect the evidence? And then how you finally report it in your audit report and then moving towards the end of it, towards the other assignments. So this is the flow of the audit. And yes, I'll be also covering two important technical articles in this video today. One is that new technical article on sustainable uh, reporting, so which was issued in August. And then I will also discuss with you data analytics. Okay, so these are the two important things which might get tested this time. So please pay attention and listen to this video till the end. Let's resume. So practice management. Here I talk about the good ways of how to give a tender. What is a tender? Tender is that I propose. I propose to the counterparty that may I become your audit firm. You are need, in need of an audit and I am a good candidate for it. So you give a tender, proposal. Your tender might be accepted or rejected. So what all matters you can disclose in your tender? What all things should be there in your tender? What do you or what things you should consider before sending a tender? It's not that you'll just close your eyes and send the tender. So there are a few things that you need to consider yourself also. So you should consider, do you have enough resources? Or are you at your already, you know, I recently just uh, called some uh, digital marketing firm and they said, we're already in the time crunch. You know, we already booked so much, so we don't have time. I, I really liked that, but you say that I don't have time and, you know, this is how it works. So that is where you actually... Uh, Make it clear that right now you do not have the resources. You're already overwhelmed with the work. So this is like you have to make sure that you know that, okay, there are some resources which we need to consider. And accordingly, we will give the tender. If we are already in time crunch, if we are already full with the client's work and we don't have enough team members to allocate to any new audit, then please don't put in the tender. Then completeness. Will you be able to complete the audit which you are wanting to tender on? Like, do you have the expertise in that? Yes, do you have the skills in that? And would you be able to deal with the risks associated with that engagement? Maybe that is in a specialized sector, which where you've never worked into. So that is something you need to consider. And will you be able to maintain your independence in that particular situation? So maybe you are tendering for being a component auditor and you realize that in this case, component auditor is the auditor of the subsidiary. I might have to work under the instructions of the group auditor. So I need to see that will I be able to maintain the independence or I am becoming or tendering for the audit of someone whom financial statements I'm preparing. So once again, I'm not independent, no? Management threat comes into the picture. So don't tender for such uh, engagements. And what matters should be there in the tender? What should be there within the tender? Your fee should be there. Your relevant experience in that particular sector should be there why the client needs the audit you should be you know you sell what like just you make uh, a good cv there are so many videos i post on what you should uh, add into your resume or cv to get a job so I always say that what the person wants what the employer wants play with those words read the job description similarly you are supposed to say that why the client needs the audit maybe he's listed maybe he's in the hotel industry 
and he's required by law to get the audit done and i am also an auditor in the hotel industry then i'm like you need audit because of these these laws and i am the best person to do that that's how you uh, you know advertise yourself and then approach what would be your approach to the audit when the nature of your approach how do you conduct your audit which kind of assurance you're going to give them in the audit report what will be your timing by when you will be reporting what what will be your direction of the audit right how do you conduct procedures how many member of team uh, team members of audit you will assign to this engagement so all these things you will mention in your tender and if you have some kind of uh, special ways of auditing like for example if you are a very modern kind of a person and you have those uh, test of data auditing software and data analytics which you use in your audit computer assisted audit techniques so you want to mention them also in your tender so this is what all things you mention in the tender before you send it then the question comes that okay once i have tendered for it now i would be let's suppose my tender is accepted now the last call is mine let's suppose the client said that yes your tender is accepted now it's on me whether i want to accept the client or not so how do i decide whether i want to accept on what basis should i decide whether i want to accept the client or not so i accept the client by doing these things by you know cross checking these things first i need to obtain professional clearance what is professional clearance you contact the outgoing auditor yes you contact the outgoing auditor who is he he is the previous auditor of the client so you contact him you ask him why did you leave what were the reasons of leaving what was the previous audit opinion was it qualified was it adverse what is uh, what if it is with disclaimer of opinion you call them and ask them get a written representation or get some kind of report from them then why do you do this because you need to first understand that auditor you feel like he is someone who's from my profession and you rely on that person but you are not relying on the client so you want to know from the auditor how was he treated in this particular situation and how he felt in that audit what were the risky areas of the audit how did he deal with those risky areas what were the procedures or the work done by the auditor in the previous financial statements so you want to talk about the previous to the previous auditor about all these things now there are two situations previous auditor will take up your call previous auditor will not take up your call and will not respond to you so if he talks to you responds to you in a positive way you get every information that you needed good go ahead you got your professional clearance but if that auditor does not reply if that auditor does not give you a positive reply if he tells you that you know we left this engagement because this client was pressurizing us or this client intimidated us this client said that if or the client removed us from the audit because we gave a modified opinion So if such things comes up from the professional the other person who just left the engagement then you are not supposed to take up this engagement because you rely on your professional world you rely on your uh, professional body and the associates of that professional body so that auditor is someone who's from your own professional body so you're going to not take up that particular client because then maybe he will do the same thing with you so that is what i mean by professional clearance then you must see whether the preconditions of audit exist or not what are preconditions of audit before we accept any engagement we should have a proper communication and in written we should have this thing in the engagement letter that you know we will be allowed access to the information as and when required if we say that we need to inspect something from the employees we will be allowed to do it plus preparation of financial statement is the responsibility of the management and not the auditor auditor is just going to assess them and give a reasonable assurance on it but the uh, it's the client's responsibility to prepare it for fraud also it's client's responsibility to prevent and detect it so all these things pre conditions of the audit that we should have access to the information we should not be uh, you know there should be no limitation on the scope of the audit and as and when required all the resources should be available at our disposal to conduct the audit seamlessly so these are the pre conditions of the audit and then you must check the reputation of the firm for example in few case studies there was there that a case was going against that audit client because maybe he did some fraud he didn't pay some fees in the previous years so we were you know that that comes to your reputation that 
uh, you were having some case against you and that is something we got to know from the newspaper so now as as the new auditor, it's not that if something was like this going on, you just simply say, no, I'll not do the audit of this client. You need to dive into that matter, that what was the case going against, who was at fault, what are the current findings of the case, what is the current uh, result of the case, what is the probability, you can talk to the you know lawyers, you can talk to the experts, what do they feel about it. So these are the things that we are supposed to consider in the reputation or the KYC. So basically, you know your client via these things. And then competence, of course, before you accept your client, you should also understand that are you competent? Again, you first considered it while sending the tender. Again, you need to consider are you competent for the uh, this audit of this client or not, right? And then fees, what fees you should charge? What are the risks of this engagement? Do you have resources, team members, money laundering? What is money laundering? Let's discuss money laundering. Your client might be involved in money laundering. Money laundering is the process by which you convert your black money into white money. By following three steps, placement, layering, integration. Placement is when you place the illicit funds into the legal funds. So for example, if you have black money and you're doing a lot of cash sales, so you involve that black money into the cash sales, right? that you were having those till receipts with you. So you just involve that black money or you just mix that black money for the first time in those till receipts. In that drawer, you put your black money also where you have the selling amount. So that is placement. What is layering? What is layering? When you mix it, now you transfer that money again and again from one person to another person, from one country to another country. So you have small bank deposits which you make. So this is how you mix the things up just so that you uh, totally devastate the audit trail, disrupt the audit trail. If somebody tries to find the source of the fund, they want to be able to find it because you've mixed it so much. And then once after you've done lots of mixing, now you finally integrate it. That means you introduce that black money again into the economic, legal economic money. So basically you integrate it, for example, you buy some luxury item, you buy a house, you buy some, uh, you can say not just house, you buy some jewelry, a luxury car. So that is how if some somebody would ask you that how did you buy it when you like you buy it and then you sell it. Once you sell it, the money will be in your bank account. That would be your white money. Why? Because if somebody asks you from where you got this money, you'll say I've sold that thing. So this is how you conduct money laundering, which is illegal, not just it is unethical, but also illegal, which has a lot of, uh, you can say, consequences attached to it. And if you are involved in this money laundering or if your client might be involved in money laundering, because there are some red alerts. What are these alerts of money laundering? First, cash intensive business. So basically, if the company is having a cash intensive business, there's a lot of cash sales. So there's a high alert that this company might have been involved in money laundering because then they have the opportunity to launder the money. If everything is coming in your bank account, then it becomes really difficult to uh, launder the money because it's quite visible that this is what you received from your sales, right? Or you might be having two businesses. In one business, you're receiving cash sales. Another, you're receiving online sales. So you can mix those things. That is also something which is fishy. And then secondly, maybe you are making a lot of overseas transfers. So you are sending money abroad a lot or you have those bank accounts in tax seven countries, right? So you know what tax seven countries are. So you might be transferring Hong Kong is one of them. And, uh, you know, the Cayman Islands. So you might be transferring money there. That is something which depicts that maybe you're involved in money laundering. And thirdly, what we have is our indicator that we might be, you know, uh, we made an unusual transaction during the year. So maybe there was some very unusual high amount transaction which suggests as well that you were involved in some kind of money laundering some big amount which was paid somewhere or some big purchase which was made which was unusual so that is something which is an alert for money laundering 
So you need to find how can you, what are the procedures for money laundering? What are the procedures suggested by ACCA? See, they say every firm first, first of all should appoint an MLR. Who's an MLRO? He's a senior level person, money laundering reporting officer. In every firm, there should be an MLRO. If anyone suspects money laundering in any entity, the person is supposed to, you know, communicate this to the MLRO. He's supposed to tell the MLRO that I have this suspicion that there might be some money laundering. So in this case, he's a very senior nominated appointed person. Okay, he should be a senior person and he's supposed to prepare a report which he sends to the uh, investigation agencies. For example, in UK, you have that agency and uh, then you just prepare a report where you have the name of the suspect, the person who reported you, then evidences which you've collected by far. Yes, and the amount is also mentioned. Whatever you can materialize, whatever you can uh, quantify, you put it in the report and this is given to the investigation agencies like we have enforcement agency in the UK. So this is what MLRO does. Now every firm should have an MLRO. But how would the other employees know that there is an MLRO and we are supposed to, uh, you know, uh, report to him? So what we have is we have to train our employees. So client training or you can say employee training. You are supposed to train your employees and tell them that, you know, there's an MLRO. If you find any suspicion of money laundering, you are supposed to report it to the MLRO and then he will further make a report and report it to the enforcement agencies, whether that person, that employee is at the senior level, managerial level, or if he is at the very operational base level. Every employee should be trained. Thirdly, Know your client procedures, due diligence of your client. Whenever you accept any client, you should perform KYC. You should understand their reputation, anything going against them. Maybe that person is politically exposed person. Why PEPs are having a high risk of money laundering? Because then they are having the access to the money of the world, money of the country. So public money is or treasury is with the politically exposed people. So they are high risk persons with no offense. So this is something which is there in money laundering. Another uh, way, just not this, keep the records. Record keeping should be enhanced. So in, in case of future investigations, you should keep your records at least for five years with you. Just in case something happens, you still have the record of that audit client. So these are the few things which ACCS suggests, not all, but few things which ACCS suggests against money laundering. So that is what we have to follow as an auditor as well, because we will be ACCS if we are auditor. So we should consider, we should do KYC or due diligence of our client to see whether they might be involved in money laundering or not. So that's how we accept the client. Once we have accepted the client, finally, if everything goes well and now you want to get engaged to the client, so now you want to start the audit process. So you sign an audit engagement letter. What all things are there in the audit engagement letter? Your objective and the scope of the engagement, what you're going to do in the audit, what's the scope, what they want from you, reasonable assurance, limited assurance, review engagement, full audit, internal audit, external audit, everything should be mentioned, what kind of audit and what's the scope. We need to do the audit of just the group or components also, or maybe we are supposed to do audit of one segment only, not just the whole company, so everything. Then your responsibility should be mentioned. What is auditor's responsibility and management's responsibility? You will do this. You'll play this part in the proper uh, engagement. I'll play this part. And then what will be your acceptable framework? Because whenever you enter into an assurance engagement, you should have a subject matter and you should have a uh, reporting framework. So subject matter is financial statements in audit and reporting framework usually is IFRS. So we need to see whether the subject matter is complying with the IFRS, that is the reporting framework or not. So we need to find what is our applicable framework. Then what is the fees of the audit and what basis this fees was decided? Uh, it's usually decided on the scope of the work. And if I talk about the fees, uh, you know, there are some things that you need to keep in mind. Let's talk about that. When you quote a fees, that fee should be based upon your work which you're going to conduct. Because if you lowball, what is lowballing? Lowballing is reducing the price way too much. So if you find someone teaching you at a very low cost, that's good, you must go there. But uh, if we talk in terms of auditors that 
you know if you low ball if you charge very less money so maybe you are not contended with that fees and you might compromise the quality in the long run so you have seen these case studies in the audit paper where the auditor in the quality management issues said that we are getting less fees so they kept the materiality level higher so they said we will you know run away from the work because then the fees is not equivalent to the efforts that they are putting so that's why low balling is something which leads to deterioration of quality of the engagement quality of the audit which is unethical that's why low balling is also considered or frowned upon so it's not prohibited but it's frowned upon and then uh, you know you should not be compromising on your fees your fees should be strictly based upon the work that you going to do so that you do not deteriorate the quality of the work and also you have some rules for advertisement as an auditor when you advertise what are the rules that you must follow there are three rules you must follow rule number 1 that you should not advertise something which or in a certain way which brings disrepute to the profession yes you should not advertise in a way which brings disrepute to profession secondly you should not have any false claims in your advertisement so if in the case study you find that you know uh, the auditor said that we will save tax for you or there's an acca uh, affiliate and he says that i am an acca member so that is a false claim right so this is something that you must ensure and thirdly what else you can say uh, it's it's also about not just bringing disrepute false claims but also not putting other downs not putting other professionals down or within your profession only putting your associates down i am the best you when you say i am the best then you are saying that others are not good so that is something you know you must have heard best uh, institute for this best this best that that means you are saying that others are not good so that is also something which is against the code of ethics because that's not a good rule of advertisement when you say that uh, others are not as good as what you are so these are the rules of advertisement and then we have finally the planning stage of the audit so first we tendered then we accepted the client then we signed the engagement letter we saw the fee basis we saw the advertisement and we saw the ethics now let's move on to the planning stage of the audit once we have signed the engagement letter and the audit has begun so what is the objective of the audit objective of the audit is primarily to give an audit opinion right so if you want to give an opinion you need to do some work you need to do some procedures and collect some evidences so that you can give a, at the end of the day a conclusion that okay this is what i feel uh, is the financial statements true and fair or not so in the exam you can be asked about audit risk or you can be asked about romm which is risk of material misstatement if they ask you about audit risk three risks are associated with audit risk inherent risk yes then you have controlled risk then you have your detection risk so what is inherent risk so inherently some things are already risky naturally they are risky ifrs 9 is naturally complex and risky related party transactions it's inherently risky because it is very material so inherently risky areas are like for example if you talk about anything like hedging if you talk about uh, foreign currency foreign currency retranslation that is also risky so that is an inherently risky area in financial statements control risk is that due to weakness in your control you might not be able to give the best outcome so weakness in control means there are some deficiencies due to which there are some misstatements uh, which are unfounded so that is something which is control risk then detection risk that maybe this is a new client maybe you do not have enough resources and competence and maybe you have some sampling risk due to which you might not be able to detect the material misstatement so that's detection risk okay but romm just has inherent risk and romm just has control risk so romm does not consist of detection risk so in your exam what is your strategy to answer the audit question what is the technique of answering these risk questions the only technique is m t r please pay attention when i say materiality these days the materiality is to be calculated first of all you guys must be knowing the th threshold okay so it's based upon revenue total assets and pbt okay 
homework write it down in the comment section what are the thresholds of these three things now once you have found the threshold of the materiality what you are supposed to do is you are supposed to in this situation of triple a which has changed a little you are supposed to get a threshold for example uh, if i talk about materiality based upon revenue it's usually 5 to 10 percent right so let's suppose after doing this we are getting a threshold of around 5000 to 15000 maybe okay i'm assuming this 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 is what we are getting as figures now whether i should keep materiality here or here or in the middle towards the lower side or the higher side see if your client is new materiality should be lower if your client is like facing some material risks, what kind of risks I'm talking about? Risks of not uh, those inherent risk or where I talk about the accounting treatment going wrong, but maybe there's management bias, just of trying to obtain listing. Corporate governance shortcomings are there. Uh, there is something like, you know, the increase in risk due to some unusual transaction, fraud, risk of fraud. So when you have such situations, then you keep the materiality on the lower side. Otherwise, you increase the materiality gradually. Yes, gradually you increase the materiality as and when the years pass by. Because then you get good understanding of your client. So, understanding of the client you achieve by ISA 315, where you understand the environment of the client. Pestle analysis is done. Political, environmental, social, uh, technological, economic and legal uh, environment of the client is understood. Risks associated with that. So, you base your materiality on these factors. So, you in the question paper would already be given that, okay, base the materiality on revenue, base the re uh, materiality on PBT. So, you will calculate this threshold. You will just have an overview of the risks in the case study. And for three marks, you know, for three marks directly, there will be maximum of three marks will be given briefly. You just explain that this is going to be my materiality. Uh, so if I base my materiality on revenue, these are the thresholds, but I'll keep it on the lower side because there are new risks because it's a new client. It's trying to obtain listing. It has corporate weakness, governance weakness. And, you know, there are some uh, material risks like fraud and uh, something which is, you, you know, what is the meaning of materiality by nature. So if you think there are some risks which are material by nature, so you're going to say that, okay, this is the reason I'm keeping it on the lower side. So if the formula of the uh, materiality is to be considered, you know, in any situation, your detection risk, in any situation, your detection risk is high, your materiality needs to be lower. Because there will be inherent risk, there will be control risk, but you need to detect them. But if your detection risk is also high, then you need to keep the materiality at a very low level. So, you need to consider when the risk is high, materiality is low. When the risk is less, materiality can be little high. So, this is how you prioritize your materiality. And then going forward, once you've accepted the client, uh, what you have is, yeah, answer writing technique. So, materiality is given. You just apply the materiality to a given uh, risk and say, this is material to the revenue. Then you talk about its treatment. So majorly, if I talk about the treatment and risk questions, I want you to go and listen to my uh, recording of SBR revision, grant revision, which is there on my YouTube channel in the live section. Just go through that. I've explained the IFRSs or find any such revision which you can find, okay, which is related to uh, SBR or IFRSs so that you just, you know, refresh yourself with the standards. Because when you have to explain audit risk, for example, Many, uh, the most you can say favorite topic of the examiner in AAA is research and development, capitalization process under IS-38. So there you need to know what is the capitalization process. I should meet pirate criteria. And if pirate is met, then only we capitalize it. So you should be writing the treatment as it is, right? Then share-based payment, employee benefits, your deferred taxation, deferred tax asset created, unused tax losses, your IFRS 5 caps in. 
So that's a major chunk of your AAA as well. So I'm not going to revise and waste your time again talking about those. So I would say whatever briefest video you find on my channel also, like for SBR, I must have conducted it for three hours. Prior to this, I might have conducted something around one or two hours for IFRSs in general, which is for diploma in IFRS. You might refer to that as well. So that will help you to the uh, for the treatment understanding of the this question. Then risk. That what is the risk? You told about the materiality of, let's suppose, that intangible asset. You told about its treatment. Now, the risk is that they have capitalized, even if they were not supposed to capitalize. So, the risk is that my asset is overstated and my profit is understated. So, you have to clearly mention what is the risk. Asset is overstated and that is understated. That's the risk that they want. So, you need to give it very good framework of materiality, treatment and risk. This gives you three marks. One for materiality, one for treatment, another for the risk. So from every one risk identified, we can get three marks if we answer in this way. There are some risks where we are not able to uh, get the materiality. So you'll get two marks only. So in that situation, you know, you have to bifurcate. For example, if the question is for 24 marks or the question is for 18 marks, let's suppose. That's what usually it is. So let's suppose it's for 18 marks. And I have identified six risks. These are enough. If I'm giving them in a format of MTR. If out of them, uh, two risks I'm giving for, two risks I'm giving for two marks only. That means I'm not able to find its materiality because there's no amount associated with it. Then I will give two more risks just for my coverage. So eight risks. And I have to give priority risk. And I'm telling you, if your risk is irrelevant, if your risk is not in the marking scheme of the examiner, you will not get marks for it. That is professionalism, which you have to achieve by, you know, it's like you are uh, targeting something. So you have to practice it, practice it again and again. Most of the times you'll go off the track. You will identify the risk maybe in wrong order, or maybe you will not identify the risks which were relevant. You might identify relevant risk. That is what practice is for. You still have a few days with you. You can still make sure that you are good in identifying the risk and, you know, prioritizing them. Okay. So that is the technique of answering our risk questions. And lastly, if I have to talk about risk, I'll talk about the business risk. So business risk is like when you are supposed to comment upon the going concern problems. For example, there might be business risk if gearing is affected. There might be business risk that, for example, there was some point of expansion. And what if it is unsuccessful? That expansion is unsuccessful. High competition is there in the case study. So more the competition, more the business risk. So you will mention that. What if you fall out to your competitors someday? Maybe uh, you are doing a lot of amount is being paid on advertisements. So that is a cash problem. Cash is a very important factor. So it's a drainage of cash. Cash problems, they indicate liquidity problems. Liquidity problems indicate you might not be a going concern in the future. So these are the business risks which you will identify in the case study and accordingly explain. Uh, it's just for two marks. So you're supposed to identify it, explain it properly, not just identify and just get off with it. Explain it properly why it is a business risk, right? And then move forward to the next risk. So that is for our planning stage of the audit. Okay, so we are now moving ahead towards our group audit. Okay, so usually, you know, I'm not explaining you the IFRSs here because I've told you that you can manage it yourself and I've told you the technique and I've given you the resource. You'll find it in the uh, YouTube channel itself, the IFRSs. But when I talk about group audit, now I'm talking about consolidation. So within this uh, revisionary video of SBR, you will find consolidation as well. Rules of consolidation, basic consolidation, foreign subsidiary, cash flow, your change in group structure. So you need to understand that also. That's why, you know, AAA is more complex because as if I see the AAA syllabus, that's very easy. But when I combine it with SBR, it's like AAA is the framework and the content is SBR only. So ISAs are like, you can say reviewing of the IFRS. So if you want to know IFRS, you want to be able to review them. So IFRS is a very important for you. So when you accept any group audit engagement, first of all, you need to understand that I need sufficient and appropriate audit evidence with regards to consolidated 
process, consolidation process. So before I accept them, I should get that assurance that I will be able to collect sufficient and appropriate audit evidence related to consolidation. If I want to be able to get it, I will not get into this engagement. Maybe they say the component auditor is in foreign current uh, country or the component auditor won't allow you to talk to them. You can't talk to the component auditor. So in that situation, you will say, I, how will I collect sufficient and appropriate audit evidence? So I will not accept such an engagement, right? And then component auditors, Will you be able to rely on the work of the component auditors? Do you think, can you rely on the work of the uh, component auditors? Are they having enough knowledge, training and experience? Do you think that they are professional enough? And do you think that uh, they are working in the right direction? So that is what you need to see for the component auditors before relying on their work. Then materiality of unaudited portions. So if you say that I'm the group auditor, I'm the group engagement partner. So I am responsible for mostly everything. I'm responsible for the group audit opinion. So in that situation, you're not auditing everything. No, you're auditing the parent. You're not auditing all the subsidiaries. Maybe there are component auditors attached to it. That is the auditor of the subsidiary. So what is the materiality of those component which we are talking about? So what is the materiality? If it is material, I might not go uh, for this because then it becomes really difficult if that component or uh, component is very material. So that's what you consider. And, you know, you should understand the group and its components as well before you accept a group audit engagement. Then for the component auditor, how can you rely on the work on the of the component auditor? How can you rely on the work? You need to assess... You need to assess his independence. Is this component auditor independent? Is he able to work like himself? And okay, if I even talk from the perspective of the component auditor, let's suppose you're an auditor and you want to get appointed as the auditor of the subsidiary. Then also you're supposed to consider, will you be independent in this case? Assess that. Do you have enough skill set to work in this? That means have you ever been the... Uh, group auditor or the subsidiary auditor because in the consolidation process you are supposed to give the reports uh, the financial statements of the subsidiary are retranslated to the functional currency of the parent and then the reports are given in a certain way that is instructed to us by the group auditor or the group management that you are supposed to you know uh, send us the reports as per IFRSs as per our reporting date so you need to make those adjustments you need to align the accounting policies so do you have that skill set so in the case study, if they say we've been group auditor and now we are appointed as subsidiaries auditor, then they say, of course, we have experience of group audit. Why I want to be able to audit subsidiary? So totally possible, right? And then ISAs, uh, do you know enough ISAs on which are applicable on group audit? Again, that's part of your competence. Then will you be able to follow the instructions given to you by the group engagement partner? If yes, go ahead. If not, then reject. Okay, then few important terms theoretically you might get a six five marker directly what is joint audit when two or more companies together they conduct audit procedures and give a combined audit opinion so you might get positives of it negatives of it when i gave my triple i got this uh, question for six marks so i think it's very important so positives are that you will be able to give improved service now because now there will be cross verification. There will be proper, uh, you know, demarcation of work. This is your area. This is my area. And we will be able to save on time and resources uh, as an auditor, right? Then locations, let's suppose uh, it will give us some geographical benefit as well. So maybe I am in India and the other auditor is in UK. So we are auditing our client and he also has offices in India and UK as well. So we can actually go and to the site and visit and do the work in both the countries because we have two auditors for this client. So that's an advantage. Then more assurance is given because of course, if two people have worked on something, they would be able to detect more mistakes in a more efficient manner as opposed to one person doing it. So that is more assurance. And then uh, negatives. What are the negatives of it? It will be expensive for the client. They will use different methods, both of both of the people. They might have conflicts over a few things. But if I talk about this joint audit in general, you know, before they start the audit, they need to have a meeting done. And in that meeting, they actually discuss that what will be our process going forward. They totally demarcate their responsibilities that this is your area of work. This is my area of work. 
and when they will be meeting next for the you know they also meet for the review of the work then they meet for the report part as well so they have meetings consistently for all the steps of the audit so they keep they try to keep their conflicts like they try to resolve the conflicts but still this might lead to conflict so these are the advantages and disadvantages of joint audit then what we have is transnational audit so transnational audit is audit conducted which is even relied upon outside the domestic country outside your country as well for which purposes maybe you are taking loan from abroad so for lending purposes maybe you are making an investment abroad so for investment purposes or maybe for regulatory purposes also so transnational audit is an audit which is also relied upon outside the country yes and then okay so this is what i mean by like group audit so i have told you the risk situations planning situation uh, like how you answer it mtr and i have also explained you how you accept the client like i have told you the theoretical portions of your syllabus more now once we are done with these theory portions there is also another process okay uh, which i want to talk about which is evidence or you know the stage of when you collect evidence and you conduct procedures so for every standard guys we conduct procedures and we conduct evidence i'll take an example here so let's take an example of um let's take an example of whichever favorite standard you might have let me check my okay ifrs 9 let's take up ifrs 9s law soloins yes so in law soloins you must know that there are two types of law soloins is one is 12 month expected law soloins another is lifetime expected law soloins and the law soloins must be created by a statement of profit and loss and the law soloins uh, is present value is calculated it is probability weighted yes so all these things are there and uh, you create a 12 month expected law soloins when you know its credit risk has not increased significantly you create a lifetime expected law soloins if the credit risk has increased significantly once this is being done then you are supposed to you know uh, once the 12 month in lifetime expected law soloins is you've sorted then you create the law soloins via p and l and if the law soloins is on debt instruments which were kept under fair value through oci then there's a separate provision for it that you don't take the loss below than the amount of the you don't take the loss below than the amount of fair value so the, these are the rules of ifrs 9 loss allowances now how can i make a procedure out of it or how can i make procedures out of this section of the standard let's suppose in a case study this was tested where they talked about loss allowances so i will first my procedure will be discuss okay discuss with management what should i discuss see i told a verb here discuss is a verb do discuss discuss with the management now what should i discuss i should discuss with them their assumptions to assess assumptions regarding assumptions regarding credit risk to assess reasonability to assess the reasonability of those assumptions i must discuss them with the management first understand their stance on it then if you talk about a uh, second risk based upon the case study see procedures are always framed based upon case study let's suppose that was related to a bond debenture so obtain obtain the uh, bonds bond document bond issued or bond purchased document to assess its existence or to verify its existence not assess verify so document to verify its existence then uh you can say obtain a experts report regarding 
क्रेडिट रिस्क असेसमेंट You can even get a written representation. See, written representations, expert reports, all these expert reports are still reliable if you rely on the expert. But the written representations are supporting evidences. These are not uh, which can be completely relied upon, right? These are just additional evidences. So this is how you frame your procedures. For loss allowances, you can talk about the pre-calculation of the loss allowance, uses of the probability, how they have to calculate the probability, on and on and on, based upon the case study, no? So the way you answer the procedure is that you write the verb first. Then you write, what are you checking? Content. Then why? Which assertion are you checking? For example, here I was checking existence. Yes. Then sometimes for recalculation, I check mathematical accuracy. So what do we mean by these assertions? See, if your professional marks will be deducted, if your procedures won't be on point, if they will be irrelevant, I saw some mocks like uh, you you guys were writing irrelevant procedures. The way you were writing was correct, but the it was not relevant. It was related to something else and you were writing about maybe it was related to intangible assets, but then you were saying let's calculate the fair value of something which was irrelevant. So that is something which is very important for getting the professional marks as well. So when I talk about assertions for any element in the statement of financial position, things that I need to check is the revac, which is basically uh, the, you know, I need to check whether it was recorded correctly or not. I need to check its, uh, I need to check its valuation, accuracy, classification, its existence, whether it exists or not, whether I have right over it. So rights and obligation, its existence, whether that asset exists, physical verification can be done for that. Valuation, you can obtain a valuation report, valuer's report. Then its accuracy, you can recalculate stuff for assessing the accuracy and classification. So sometimes in the question, you know, they give you a proper assertion. For example, write the procedures related to valuation. Then every time you're not supposed to mention obtain this to check the valuation, verify the valuation. Now the question itself is saying valuation. So you can just stick to valuation then. Then you'll talk about recalculation, you'll talk about uh, experts report, or maybe you'll talk about the bank statement to verify the amounts. So it's it's like you are already given the assertions and accordingly you're supposed to prepare the procedures. Then if I talk about assertions related to statement of profit and loss, then we have OC3 cap, which is occurrence. Yes. Then I have classification. How do you classify it? Is it a capital expenditure, research expenditure? Then you have completeness. Have you recorded every 100% of the income and expenses? For example, in case of IFRS 15, the risk is about the cutoff. So that is completeness only, right? That you've completely recorded the sales amount. Then you talk about your uh, this uh, accuracy. And lastly, presentation. So cutoff is also there, OC3 cap, so cutoff. So these are the P&L related assertions which you assess by performing some procedures. So procedure is the work that you do. So based upon these assertions, you do the procedures. And finally, you end up getting uh, some evidence. So what do I mean by this evidence? How do you collect evidence? For example, you said review the board minutes. Review the board minutes is a procedure, but evidence related to it will be uh, maybe the board minutes, copy of board minutes, copy of board minutes. Why do you need them? Frame the sentence, that's your complete evidence. Notes of discussion, if you discuss something with the management, notes of that discussion is your evidence. Why do you need them? Complete the sentence. Then, if you say obtain bank statement, copy of bank statement, extract of bank statement, that's your evidence. When you say that I went for a physical verification, so the photographic evidence that you went there, what was the situation? So photographic evidence of the physical inspection. Yes, that's your evidence. So this is how you're supposed to collect evidence related to a particular question. 
So in question number two, mostly you are asked about accounting standard matters to be considered. So you will be given a standard particular area would be there. Maybe it's related to IS 37 provisions. So you will first write about its materiality of that provision, treatment of its pro uh, provision, how it was done. Majorly in that question, they would be doing it wrong, terribly wrong. So you'll comment upon its impact, like how it impacts the financial statements, what is overstated, understated, and how further it might impact the audit opinion as well, if it remains uncorrected. And uh, then you will talk about their evidences or procedures, whatever is asked in the question. So please understand that procedures are separate, evidences are separate. So you will write five to six evidences for that. So if the question is for six marks and they talk about comment upon the matters to be considered and also give the evidences. So three marks for this, three marks for procedures or evidence, whatever it is there. So one procedure gives you one mark, one evidence gives you one mark. So please allocate your time accordingly. If you think you've written something irrelevant, then write more procedures just for the buffer. Okay, so this is what we have in our uh, evidence stage. Now, guys, let's talk about ISA 402, relying on the work of your service organizations. What are service organizations? Sometimes, you know, the clients, they outsource their work, like payroll work is outsourced to someone else. And uh, as an auditor, we might not be, visit, be able to visit them. So we need to consider that what work they've outsourced, is it material to our financial statements, then we need to visit them and do audit of that work. If it is not material, then we need to understand that service organization. So we might end up getting a type 1 report or a type 2 report. What is type 1 report? Where you just talk about where the uh, you know service organization gives you a report on its design and implementation of the internal control. What internal controls are there in the uh, service organization. They just give you a report on design and implementation of that service organization. When we get a type 2 report, we just don't talk about design implementation, but we also talk about its operating effectiveness. Is it operating correctly? Operating effectiveness is also considered. So we get a report. This is more uh, comprehensive report and more preferable report in case of risky situations. So this is ISA. 402 for service organizations. Then, okay, we also have uh, more reliance areas. Let me just talk about that before I move on to the technical article. Relying on work of others. ISA 620, it is about auditors expert. And then what we have is, okay, then I have ISA 610 on internal auditor. So ISA 620, I will rely on the auditor's expert because I will consider his knowledge, training and experience. You know, I will collect sufficient and appropriate audit evidence that whatever work I've given to the auditor's expert, he has done it adequately. And I need to, you know, perform procedures on which expert I need for what work. I need to see the nature and the scope of the work. I need to convey it to the auditor's expert uh, you know that this is the work I need from you. This is the scope of the engagement. Then I need to check the, I need to review the work of the expert also. How will I review the work? I'll see that what assumptions he's used, what are his sources of data, whether he's consistent with his assumptions or not. Whether he's consistent, not just with assumptions, but if what work he did in the past, does that work meet the actual result? Like, you know, you compare it that what work he did in the past versus what was the actual reality. So you know his past trend. So you say that whether it was consistent or not. So this is ISA 620. ISA 610 says internal audit function. So you need to understand the internal audit function and then you need to understand what the work the internal auditor is doing. Based on that, you place reliance on him. Again, you consider his knowledge, training, experience as usual. You consider his independence. You consider uh, the competence and yeah, that's it. So this is what you have in ISA 610. So relying on the work of others, we are done with that. Now let's move on to the, uh, okay. So by now, we've revised a lot of things. Let's just get a total uh, understanding of it. 
So we've revised, we started with ethics. We started with ethics. We went on to uh, meaning of ethics, principles of ethics, the ethical threats. We went on to money laundering. Then we went on to the practice management, how we tender, how we accept, and how we then have an engagement letter, rules of advertisement, how you should quote your fees. Uh, then we went on to the risky situations where we discussed about the you know, the uh, risks associated, for example, uh, we talked about the auditor risk and the ROMM and the business risk, the uh, technique to write answers. We discussed the procedures, the evidence part and the, you know, uh, how we get sufficient and appropriate audit evidence based upon the procedures that we conduct on various, uh, you know, standards, various uh, transactions. And then we went on to the, you know, how we rely on the work of other people. That's a theoretical area. Now, finally, we are moving on to data analytics. Okay. So in this data analytics, I'm going to talk about what is the use of data analytics? Like you can find a five marker. It's a very favorite topic of the examiner. Once again, this is also a technical article which was issued. So you can find a mar five marker on this. So we use big data. Okay. We use what is big data? It's like whatever whatever you search on Google, it is stored somewhere. There's a cloud to it. There's something attached and whatever you search goes there. So there's a big data. So you are supposed to, you know, everyone is using this data to get some analysis sort of thing. For example, I've posted this video on YouTube. After some time, video, uh, you know, Google and even the YouTube studio will give me some analytics that this was the views of the uh, video. This is from where you got the views. This is from, uh, these are the number of likes. These are the number of comments. These are the geographies from where the people watched. So we know that, okay, these are the analytics of the YouTube channel, which we have. So analytics, they give me analytics in for, uh, form of percentage. They give me analytics in form of pie charts, graphs. So you analyze stuff. So even if you're using QuickBooks, if you have ever used QuickBooks, any accounting software, you normally just uh, post your bills there and, you know, they will give you a chart that today even at TG Profs where I'm teaching SBR and AAA as well, you know, I, if I've, any course is sold, it is recorded in a uh, accounting software. And then they give us a report that, you know, these many enrollments are there. And these are the enrollments from this country, from that country, from global students. So that means it's giving us some kind of analysis. Even PayPal does this. So in this situation, what I'm talking about is that auditor can also use this analytical tools. Auditor can have his own data analytics tool which I even mentioned in the tender that you tender the client by saying that I use this data analytics tool and I'll be able to better manage your uh, audit. So this thing helps you to analyze, first of all, if you talk about analytical procedures. So in analytical procedures, you develop plausible relationships between financial and non-financial data. So here what they do in analytical procedures, if we use technology, then our judgment will be applied at a higher level. Our work of calculating stuff will reduce. Ratios will be calculated by a you know, standard process, which will be AI. So they will have better understanding of it. So that's something which is good and it will reduce mistakes in future. So data analytics is something which is good in a way because it reduces the uh, risk and this increases the efficiency of the auditor as well. So you might be asked a question on the benefits and the uh, negatives of this data analytics that if the auditor uses data analytics what are its advantages and what are its disadvantages so its advantages is that first of all it is easy the risk will be better understood like we will be able to dive deep into the risky areas in a better holistic manner because now we'll get to know the exact number of percentage increase decrease blah blah then it will be a quick process and analytical procedures will become you know, uh, by the machine and, you know, it's not human and the risk of judgment will reduce or the risk of biasness will reduce. But the negative is that if it's a data analytics system is made by the auditor, then it's possible to manipulate this. You know, that uh, whole process can be manipulated, that whole uh, system can be manipulated. Then there is a risk of piracy. What if the data is stolen? That's confidentiality problem. And then at the end of the day, it is... Uh, machine right so it might make mistakes as well and you know you can manipulate it which can further relate uh, lead to misstatements 
So this is what you are supposed to understand from the data analytics from the broader point of view. So you can read the technical article now related to data analytics if you want. Otherwise, if you understand this, I think you can frame your own answer yourself. Uh, you know that what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a computer assisted audit technique. So my students, you have the notes, you know, we've done computer assisted audit techniques. So data analytics is one part of it. Okay. Then what I have is the next technical article, uh, which is related to proposed ISA 5000. So let's go to that proposed ISA. Yep. Okay. So this is your technical article on the proposed ISA on sustainability assurance. So let's read it out once. Let's understand this. Okay. So please, everyone, you can also open it on your end before I begin. Yep. So let's get started. Let's check out what's there. So here what I have is general requirements for assurance engagements. So here, you know, they have recently in August 2023, they have issued this particular technical article and they are planning on to propose a auditing standard on sustainable reporting. We all know in SPR, there was a topic of integrated reporting and sustainable reporting. So you know what is sustainability? Sustainability is when you report uh, something in a holistic manner. You talk about six types of capital. You talk about uh, more disclosures because you are affecting environment. You are affecting health of people by your business. So you are supposed to report more. That increases the trust of the investor as well. It attracts green investors. So all those advantages of sustainable reporting. So basically sustainability is that we use our resources in such a decisive manner, in such a good manner that we are able to not just, you know, uh, keep the resources for our use, but we can also save the resources for our coming generations. That is what I mean by sustainable reporting, right? So now in this situation, what I am supposed to do, let's see. Here in ISA 5000, they have given us some rules, okay? So increasingly shareholders, especially institutional investors are demanding more information so they can evaluate the impact of an organization's activity on the environment and society. So we have become environment friendly. We are talking about society. We are talking about all these things. So it is organizations see a competitive advantage in publishing their green credentials as key performance indicators, driving a wider range of sustainability disclosures and corporate information. So, you know, it, when it was introduced, people used to say, you know, you just say like this, that you're helping environment, you're doing this, you're doing that. Actually, it's not true. Now, the IASB has even, you know, given out standards, IFRS is on sustainable reporting, S1 and S2. So now if those things are to be reported in proper reporting framework, we need the auditors also to audit that information. So that is what the standard is related to because we had in SBR that sustainable reporting, uh, you know, measures or how you report in the sustainable report. Similarly, we have some auditing rules as well for that particular situation. So you need to see that first of all, it's multiple. Uh, if I tell you what are the principles of this first principle is that it is having multiple frameworks. That means whatever kind of whatever kind of uh, sustainable reporting you are doing. There are many kinds of sustainable reporting if I tell you about them. First of all, you have GRI, Global Reporting Initiative. Where is it? Yes. So Global Reporting Initiative. Then you have Integrated Reporting. Then you have Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. These are three types of sustainable reports that you might prepare as an accountant, as a client. Yes. Now how the auditor needs to uh, audit them, that's on the auditor. So for that, ISSB has even given us some uh, standards like IFRS S1, IFRS S2, as I told you. And now for that, we have auditing standard as well. So which is ISSC 5000. It's an exposure draft. It's not yet finalized. It's just an exposure draft. So multiple framework is that anyone who's using any of the reporting can use this ISA for this particular uh, assurance to be provided on the sustainable reports. Now, it can also be used by non-accounting professionals. So those people who are not from ECCA, who are not accountants, but they follow a code of ethics and they're giving sustainable reports, even they can follow this uh, standard on sustainability. 
So what is sustainability? What is the context of sustainable reporting? See, you all know what is sustainability. I just told you how you use your resources in a good way that even not just our uh, generation, but the upcoming generation can also utilize the resources. So what is there in the uh, you know sustainability information? You talk about climate, emissions, energy, water effluents, biodiversity, labor practices, human rights, customer health and safety, economic impacts. So you all know these things from your SBR, I suppose. So this is what we is there in sustainability. Now, when you apply your ISA, this is important. When you apply your ISA to this particular situation, what are the objectives you want to obtain from applying this? So you are first to obtain reasonable assurance or limited assurance, whatever is the case, you need to obtain reasonable or limited assurance as applicable about whether the sustainability information is free from mist uh, material misstatement. So every time in audit, you're just worried about MMS. Okay, so you're just worried about MMS that whether there will be a material misstatement or not. So you're even worried about the sustainable information, whether if there would be an MMS on that as well. So to express a conclusion on sustainability information through a written report that conveys a reasonable assurance or a limited assurance conclusion. So either you give reasonable assurance or you give limited assurance on it as applicable and describes the basis for the conclusion. So communicate further as required by ISSA to any other relevant ISSA. So basically you give an assurance either limited or reasonable. Limited is that you just do review. Reasonable is you do detailed testing and you give reasonable assurance that it is true and fair. Uh, so in this case, you know, uh, you are supposed to give a report. Similarly, you used to give for financial statement. Similarly, you have to give for the sustainable information as well. So eyes of 5,000, let's say, contains an appendix which illustrates different form of assurance reports uh, which include reasonable and limited uh, conclusions and okay acceptance of the engagement before you accept such an engagement you should understand the scope of the work you should understand the sustainability information to be reported the reporting boundary the existence of suitable criteria determining of the level of assurance to be provided so what are you getting into? You need to understand that. You need to understand the scope of work. If you are under, uh, getting sustainable information, you know, you are reviewing it. So you should know against which criteria you are reviewing it. So S1 and S2, right? Then determining the level of assurance to be provided. Fine. Then uh, ISA highlights the importance of both firm level and engagement level quality management stating that engagement leaders shall take overall responsibility for managing and achieving quality on the engagement and also requiring that engagement leader must have competence and capabilities in assurance skills. So it's about that you should also see whether you have the skills and competence in this particular engagement or not. That's omnipresent. Then the engagement leader is also responsible for ethical considerations and ensuring that sufficient and appropriate resources are allocated to the engagement. There is a detailed guidance relating to assurance team with particularly emphasis on the relationship between the engagement team and other practitioners and whether it is appropriate to use the work of others. There is also recognition that information on which assurance is provided is often derived from sources up and down the value chain of the reporting entity. So careful planning is required to ensure that the assurance team can obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence in a timely manner. So when I talk about other information, when I talk about how well the employees are treated, or what are your labor uh, rules, you get this assurance from the employees. You get this from outside the entity. No? You talk about your environment. You get this from the maybe some NGOs. So that is something which we are saying that it's, it's difficult to get sufficient and appropriate audit evidence on this. That's why, uh, you know, you should make a proper rule whether to rely on it or not. Then... What we need to understand in the planning stage, what is being reported in the sustainable report, how it is being reported, understanding the relevant internal controls on that. Then we will make a materiality. So materiality will be like bifurcated once one materiality is as per you, as per the financial statement, that how this thing impacts the financial statement, the sustainable information. And one materiality is how it is material to the users, how it is material to the environment, to the society. If you say you're donating stuff, 
if you say you are putting money for the fund uh, to fund the education of people then how are you how material it is to the other people that is what is given to us in this uh, thing this is known as double materiality where you just not consider the materiality on financial statement but also the materiality on the uh, yes this is double materiality so you consider it you know assurance practitioner should consider both financial and impact materiality when determining their materiality level for the purposes of planning and it should also be noted that isb view is that it will not be relevant to every engagement so basically something they need to cons what is impact materiality how significance of the impacts of the business activity on the outside world so you should consider your financial materiality and the impact materiality right so that's double materiality to be considered then if you want to obtain the evidence so when responding to the risks of mmm uh, the in designing and performing further audit procedures the requirements vary depending on whether it's a limited assurance or a reasonable assurance so in limited assurance you just review analyze and maybe you inspect investigate but in reasonable assurance you do detailed testing so isa 5000 acknowledges the qualitative sustainability information and estimates a forward looking information or both potentially difficult areas so often sustainability information is forward looking and based on estimates and future plans so organization produce scenarios based on best estimate or hypothetical assumptions which might be subject to management bias or great uncertainty so evidence can therefore be difficult to obtain and assurance practitioner may need to exercise a significant level of judgment in determining whether they have obtained sae or not so they're saying this sustainable information is very subjective it's not quantified so it depends upon various factors so that's the reason you know uh, we should must consider that what will happen so we will apply our judgment over here so that's what is written here that okay we might need to get some uh, external expert or parties reviews and uh, you know it is essential that we have the time and resources to get this information then reporting it is important that users of assurance report understand the level of assurance so if it is limited assurance you'll provide a report as per limited assurance which is a negative opinion we didn't find anything bad in this uh, if it is reasonable assurance you are supposed to give a positive thing that uh, you know there is these are true and fair as per your uh, work done so greenwashing and other risks in sustainable reporting this is very important let's read it greenwashing is a significant potential pro problem what is greenwashing it's like you make false or misleading statements about sustainability information this concept is very similar to that of creative accounting so you don't do any donation but you say i do donation or you po post uh, wrong pictures regarding that so the financial information is manipulated in creative accounting in green uh, non financial information is you know manipulated so greenwashing can be considered to be fraudulent reporting added to this the systems and the processes that are generated generating sustainability information are often subject to change as per the sustainability reporting requirements to develop therefore there is a higher risk of error as well as deliberate misstatement in the sustainable information then these risks can be coupled with potential difficulties of obtaining evidence over qualitative disclosures and future oriented information uh, informing or we might issue inappropriate audit evidence there is a reputation risk of the assurance provider if they report positively which turns out to be incorrect or inaccurate or exaggerated in future so basically they're saying this is a very risky area because sustainable information first of all relates to future then it relates to qualitative things it's not something that i can verify from the bank i can verify or recalculate so it's becoming very risky for us as auditors to first of all find evidence on it second of all it's subject to biasness because it's all about projections it's all about uh, future related stuff so and we need some evidence from the third parties also like employees like uh, ngos and stuff so this is going to lead to some more risks uh, which might lead to incorrect audit opinion right so then lastly you know you might be required to consider scenario specific risk in the exam such as pressure to meet reporting deadlines requirements or meeting finance convenience there may be estimation or other areas where management judgment has been applied as in financial assurance engagement candidate should be aware of potential bias by the management and the need to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence so see you must read this ethics part out 
that uh, what will be the ethical angle to this situation this might create self review threat okay and uh, why it would create self review threat just read this out assurance providers need to adhere to the relevant ethical codes we all know what are the code of ethics okay i'm not going to explain you they've given you pipecop here then perhaps the most obvious threat to ethics uh, relates to assurance is professional competence. So first of all, you might not be competent enough to uh, give an assurance on sustainable information. While many organizations have been reporting on sustainability matters for years, for assurance providers, the new reporting standards are largely unfamiliar. So first of all, it's a new thing. So it will lead to errors, right? This will lead to not just errors on the part of the client, but also on the part of the auditor. So knowledge can be developed, but a deeper level of understanding cannot be de uh, developed overnight. So that's like uh, you might get a knowledge over ISA, you read it, you get the knowledge, but you've not practiced on it. So you might not be able to develop the de in-depth knowledge. So an assurance provider could have self-interest threat in securing an engagement to report on sustainability information. So basically, you know, it's like they might think it's a very casual thing to do. So they might get a self-interest threat that we are auditing also. Now we want to audit your sustainable information also. So self-interest threat because it will be a lucrative new line of work. So for purely commercial reasons, the audit firm might take up on the job even if they are not competent to do it. They could also be a self-review threat if an assurance provider is performing external audit and then they do sustainability uh, reporting audit as well. So in this case, separate things and quality control review is the safeguard. So that's it. So these are the things which are there. I mean, this is a very easy standard if you know sustainable reporting from your SBR. If So I, I don't think there's any issue with it, how you accept it, what are the ethical issues and how do you perform audit on it? Uh, how what are the limitations uh, of conducting audit in such a situation so i think that's it for our isa 5000 and lastly about your audit report i am putting a link in my description box you all are supposed to watch these two small videos on audit report which will easily clarify how your audit opinion is issued like when it is adverse when it is uh, you know, uh, qualified and when it is disclaimer of opinion and then what is the way, what paragraph is added when, what, how, uh, you all know if you have watched it only, Tau Kora Reed is the person I'm talking about and how his name changes and then the audit report is also modified. So I would request you to go through those two videos at 1.5 times the speed and you will be done with the revision of reporting part as well. Lastly, from the other assignments, I would like to tell you that the most important two assignments are forensic or fraud investigation and prospective financial information. So these are same kind of engagements. You might be asked procedures on fraud investigation. So you should understand that what is first of all fraud? What's your responsibility? Okay, what's your responsibility as an auditor? Uh, auditor is not responsible for the prevention and detection of fraud. Management is responsible to make such uh, stringent controls that for fraud does not happen. But uh, auditor's responsibility is that if there's any susceptibility to the fraud that you suspect that there is fraud, then you're supposed to dive deep into that fraud, right? So now I'm not talking about that fraud, which was there in external audit. I'm talking about the fraud when you are, you know, you perform an agreed upon procedures. It's, it's an agreed upon procedure assignment where the client says there's a fraud in our company. We suspect a fraud and we are appointing you that you come and do the audit. So you need to, before accepting, you need to see what's the objective of the engagement scope and timing. Do you have the skill set? Who's the intended user? If the intended user is court, then you might think twice because then you are acting as an evidence there, but, uh, witness there, expert witness there. Then uh, what? whether you have the resources or not, whether you have the skill set or not. So in the fraud, it's the only area of audit which is very dynamic where based upon the case study, you will dive into that fraud situation and then you will form procedures out of it. Okay, so this is our fraud situation. Then prospective financial information, that is the future financial information, uh, cash flow forecast. So here you perform procedures just like you perform on any other thing. So you see the assumptions, the growth rate, the inflation, whatever they've assumed in the situation, you also need to perform procedures on that. Uh, and finally conclude that, you know, whether the forecast is okay or not. So it's a review engagement sort of a thing. And uh, here you, these are the two most important other assignments for this attempt. That's why I'm just discussing these. 
So I will just request you that now you just watch the reporting videos and uh, other assignment is similar that you might be asked acceptance procedures, you might be asked procedures to be performed, you know how to perform uh, procedures, you know what are the factors to be considered before you accept and claim and that's it. So major portions we've covered from the advanced audit and assurance and this is the theory of audit and assurance I've discussed with you. Now I want you to first of all watch the IFRSS, second of all watch the reporting video and that's it. So keep smiling guys, all the very best for your exam. May God bless you all and please give your exam in with full common sense. Apply your time management, that's very important. So you should be applying your time management that means 90 minutes for question number one. Okay, question number two, 45 minutes. And uh, then you have your, that means one and a half hour. Question number three, also 45 minutes. So three hours for your paper. And this is your time allocation. So make sure you allocate your time accordingly and give your exam. So that's it, guys. All the very best. May God bless you. I am done for the day. And that's all about a grand revision. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up if it was helpful and of course if you want to enroll for any of our courses at advanced audit assurance i hope you need not again you might not sit for it again but for sbr or fr if you want to or you want to recommend a friend of yours to the co course or the lectures uh, i teach at tg profs you can find the details in the description box and bye bye